This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch launch a successful successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. What up, crowdfunders? Salvador Brigman here, the host of the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Hope you're having a great week, having a great day, etc. Uh, I've been flying my drone a lot more recently in Brooklyn, in Manhattan. For those of you nerds out there, I have a Hubsan X4 Brushless 501S, I think it is, uh, drone. So I've been taking some really cool snapshots, really cool photos and videos. And I actually think I'm going to include more of these in my YouTube videos and maybe even some of my product videos. But it's it sort of turned into this cool new hobby that I'm pursuing and I'm just like learning a lot. That's actually that's one of the reasons why I love crowdfunding too is I love learning new things. I'm both a a student and a teacher in that way. And every time I bring on a guest onto the show, I try to learn something from them. That could be tactical, that could be strategic, or even just learn more about humanity by understanding their story and where they're coming from and really getting to the crux of why they're doing what they're doing and how they are approaching the world, their mindset, all of that kind of stuff. I also try to deliver for you guys. Um, Today's interview, I actually met the guy a long time ago. We got into the crowdfunding industry about the same time. This is Ian Anderson from Launch and Release. And Ian is really special in that he is focused exclusively in helping musicians run their crowdfunding campaign. And he's been doing it for a while now. Uh, where I, you know, sort of a more, I think, an educational role. His site is very strategic in that it it helps people step by step through the, the 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 process of raising funds. And to give you some numbers here, on average, campaigns who work with launch and release raise over three thousand more than the average Kickstarter campaign in creative genres. Uh, another stat here. Hundreds of campaigners who have gone through his program have had a success rate of over 96% and have raised over $1.6 million using techniques from launch and release. Uh, He's also come on the podcast to talk about his new book, An Artist's Guide to Crowdfunding Domination, which should be out shortly, along with all of the things that he has learned from helping crowdfunders in the past few years. I think you're going to enjoy this and get a lot of practical information, particularly if you are one of the creative types in the audience and you're wondering, how do I actually raise money on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or one of these other websites? I would also like to make the announcement that I am going to be coming out with a course exclusively focused on PR. This is a course that I've been asked to produce a lot of times just because I have gotten into a lot of different media publications. I really know the dynamics of how PR works. Uh, To give you an example, I've gotten into the Wall Street Journal, been cited by the CNN, New York Times, uh, Post, what is it called? Pittsburgh Gazette, a lot of different publications that I think people consider to be more credible. So I put a lot of that information along with the information of helping many campaigners on the PR front into this course. And it's very short videos. These are sort of bite size where if you have a long day of work, you can go and watch this afterwards and they're entertaining. I include lots of graphics and transitions and cool things to spice up the videos. I put a lot more work into it than my YouTube videos and made them much more results focused. So every time you consume one of these modules, you learn a bunch of new information that you can apply directly to your PR outfit, out, outfits, outlets. So that way you can get more traffic to your campaign. 
You can build the credibility around your campaign, the social proof. You can turn more visitors into backers. I think you're going to get a lot out of uh, this course. And thus far, of the people I've showed it to, they've said it's extremely helpful, that these are things that campaigners must know, <laughs> that these are like literally things that make, can make the difference between a successful campaign and not a successful campaign. So if you want to get notified when that course comes out and be one of the early bird people to take advantage of it and get a discount, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash PR. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash PR. Uh, and also you can um, you'll probably send a few in training videos also before I come out with the course just to give you a snippet of like what it's about and all that kind of stuff. So you'll get that for free as well. I hope you enjoy this interview. It's coming up in just a second. Ian, welcome to the podcast. How you doing, man? I am doing well, Sal. Thank you so much for having me. We were having a, a sort of a pre-show recorded call. And are you actually standing up, by the way, at your desk? I am standing up at my desk. I got one of those desks that goes up and down on a motor. That's cool. I've actually seen a lot more people do that. It's probably healthier. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, if I sit all day, it kind of blows up my hamstrings and legs. So... If you're if you're going to be doing a lot of desk jockey work on the computer and such, it's a good way to go. Dude, I totally relate with that. Like humans were not meant to sit down for that long time. Like I have to at least stretch out once every other day, or my hamstrings are just really tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, old man problems. Solidly in middle age. All I'm speaking for myself. I don't know about you. But. Hey, I'm I'm getting older here. I mean, we entered the industry at the same time. I entered around the end of 2012, um, got more serious in 2013. And that's sort of when you were also starting your site. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, my former partner and I launched the idea in the middle of 2012. And, and over the last quarter of 2012, we posted um, a review of a Kickstarter a day for pretty much 100 days in a row um, that's kind of how we built our intellectual capital, so to speak, was we just jumped in and and started trying to find projects that looked like they were going well and interviewed, you know, all sorts of project creators, like to the point where I probably had to send personal messages to at least 10 campaigns or projects to get one response from from people. And and Kickstarter three times flagged my account as spam. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just trying to help uh, them out. Yeah, exactly. No, but, you, you know, they have a ton of people that are spammers who are trying to to offer BS marketing packages for a hundred bucks and, you know, mm -hmm. that just don't show any return. So I, I feel their pain there, but no, I was literally trying to get in touch with creators to, to put together the, you know, a trail of, Hey, what works here and what doesn't. So that was pretty crazy. And man, it was, uh, it was an intense hundred days, you know, like you're just getting into blog post writing and each one of those takes a couple hours and it takes a couple hours just to find each person willing to, willing to be interviewed and share what they're learning with you. And, oh man, some early mornings I developed an eye twitch for a little while, but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but it was all worth it. We, we got a hundred done and, and it kind of figured out what was going on. So no, I can't I, complain at this point. That's so great to hear because I also put my blood, sweat, and tears into my work. It is a lot of work, guys, to produce podcasts regularly, to produce YouTube videos, produce blog posts. It is a lot of work, not for the faint of heart. No, absolutely. And uh, yeah, like I was saying before, you know, I've looked at your site and we've communicated a few times over the years, but it had been probably 18 months since I'd last checked out Crowd Crux and I hopped on in November to see what you're up to. And lo and behold, here's here's a bunch of videos and here's some podcasts. And I was like, yes, yeah, we go, Sal, because <laughs> a lot of people get freaked out by that stuff and they don't have to. Um, one of the, you know, I watched a couple of your things and and one of the things I appreciated was that you were committed to the idea of getting it done and having some content that provides value and you, you know it looked to me like you didn't overly worry about all the other details like 
do I have a giant lighting kit? Do I have a backdrop? Do I have, you know, some badass custom marketing design for everything? Not, not speaking poorly of what you have, but you just, you hopped in and got going and you make it better as you go. Am I right? Yeah. I thank you so much for saying that too, because, um, you know, you sort of, sort of gotten this industry at the same time and we've both sort of grown in that way. And one of the things that I loved about your website also was that you really put content at the forefront and you have a bit more of a niche in terms of, you know, music, musicians and artists and all that kind of stuff. But I felt like you had a very similar mission and values because there are always people out there that are just looking to take value or just looking to put out content that's not really that great. And it's not really that helpful. So I feel like we sort of have a similar mission in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're, you know, uh, I think a lot of people used to look at online as sort of a a one-way street, but it's not. If you're going to run a successful business and website in a niche like music crowdfunding or, or even crowdfunding in general, which, you know, isn't nearly as big as a lot of people would think it is. Um, you have to develop a relationship. Uh, you have to have rapport with people so you know what their challenges are and you have to serve those challenges. Um, and once, once you do that, you know, it's, it's not until that point that the relationship really starts to become beneficial. So I I think it's folly to approach it in any other way. Exactly. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, where you're going with the brand And also this new product that you have coming out. Before we do that, I just wanted to mention also that one of the reasons that I am so comfortable, um, and I actually should preface that, I'm not all that comfortable. I just kind of fake it until you make it, right? But one of the reasons I'm willing to put myself out there with podcasts and videos and all these different things is you see so many successful campaigners. You and I have both seen them. And what is really in common is they're willing to take action. You know, they're willing to put themselves out there and see what happens. And maybe it's a fail, maybe it isn't, but they kind of have to be willing to try that. Absolutely. And that's, that's a common thread that, that runs in anything creative, whether it's literally creative like music or turning your creativity into a business, including your intellectual creativity of, you know, how do I help people crowdfund and turning that into a business, um, I, as a person who does business online, you constantly run into that hurdle and that challenge. Okay, it's time for me to do a release. I would like to do a little better than last time. What does that mean? It means I probably need to do something new. I need to, uh, you know, widen my repertoire and increase my skills. And that is uncomfortable every friggin' time. It doesn't really it doesn't matter get how much easier, experience yeah. you have. <laughs> No, it doesn't. And, you know, I, I spent most of the last couple of months doing things that I'm doing for the first time, online marketing sort of stuff. And man, it is tricky. And some days I just want to bang my head against this desk that moves up and down with the motor. Um, but it's what you have to do in order to be successful. And if you want your career trajectory and your path to, to move forward and upward, then you got to take the time to develop your own skills and fight through that discomfort. Exactly. And as you've been growing, what are some of the things that you have been doing with your blog, with your website? I know you have an ebook, an online course. Can you share a little bit of information about that with the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I have gotten to the point where I have a philosophy that I don't post to my blog unless I have something that is amazingly helpful. That's my goal. I don't want to waste people's time reading even 200 words if it's not going to help them. Um, so I post to the blog probably three to four times a year, and I try to just make them darn helpful. Uh, in the meantime, what I have found is a bigger challenge is just to, you know, I, I guess backing up one thing, I have the materials and the knowledge to help people do an amazing job crowdfunding. That's been established. And the crowdfunding space, uh, as far as rewards-based crowdfunding for creative people go, it isn't changing that much. You know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, even Pledge Music, they make updates to the look and feel of their website. But the core functionality is the same. 
And there hasn't been any discoveries per se in the last five years that have just, you know, tipped the industry over on its head. Um, at the end of the day, it's about understanding why you're doing what you're doing and then conveying that to people very proactively, conveying why you're doing and conveying what you're doing and doing everything you can assure or you can to assure that you reach your audience with that message. Um, so that's what I really hammer on. And getting back to what I was saying, what what I work on more so than coming up with new ideas at this point is coming up with new ways to help people understand the task that's in front of them mm -hmm. so that they can really internalize it and use, you know, leverage their inner purpose and their mission and their core values to turn their crowdfunding campaign into something that's amazing, not just something that is a quick step in the road before they do what they really want to do. Um, so that does take some work. That means interacting with customers uh, a lot. You know, I review as many of their campaigns as I can. I don't always get to them or I don't always do as good of a job telling them what I saw as I'd like to, but that's part of it. Um, and I've been trying to put, put together other ways for people to take it in. My primary uh, mode of dissemination has been an online course called the Advanced Crowdfunding System um, that people can buy on my website and if they don't just want to read all the blogs and if they want a little more help, instruction, templates, things like that. But finally decided that it was just about time to turn that stuff into a darn book. So mm -hmm. in, ter you know, in terms of what I've been doing recently, I finally got the book written on uh, – on music crowdfunding, you know, how to do it. And also really, I, I've worked with people in other genres like film and, and writing and even arts and crafts, making pottery. And this approach ap applies to really any creative genre where you're putting yourself into some sort of art, be it uh, visual, written, uh, audio, uh, audio, audio, mm -hmm. I don't to say that or or even tangible stuff and uh, this is really all... this is really too your strong suit you know you've been featured by indiegogo praised by cd baby hype bot music think tank music razor all of these different sites that are sort of geared to these creative types you know musicians artists people who maybe aren't first marketers and just kind of want a proven plan to follow you know, they don't want to become an expert marketer. As much as I love marketing, not everyone wants to become that type of person. So it seems like this is sort of for someone who doesn't really know 100% how to market their campaign, what they should be doing, even if crowdfunding is right for them, and sort of getting them up to speed kind of quickly on that. I had to interrupt this podcast episode because I want to introduce you to my friends at The Gadget Flow. Their product discovery platform reaches 22 million people per month. They've helped more than 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns thus far, and they have a social media following of more than 700,000 followers. If you want to gain access to their marketplace and list your own product, you can go to thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Absolutely. And and so the book I wrote is called An Artist's Guide to Crowdfunding Domination. And what it does is it really sets the table and gives people context and understanding of how crowdfunding works in artistic genres. And it, it works in a particular way that is based much more around um, relationship and emotion and the purpose of, of what the person is trying to accomplish. And that's very different from the standard crowdfunding campaigns we hear about, like the coolest cooler um, or, you know, the, the next big perfect computer backup widget that USBs into your phone and is a pair of sunglasses. Um, you know, crowdfunding for products, for design and technology, uh, that's pretty standard marketing stuff. And if you want to get into that, you can go out and 
either get good at marketing yourself or hire a, a marketing firm and they should be able to you know turn your features into benefits and put together something that looks pretty good and then your job is to go get in front of people and try to convert viewers into customers that is not really the place to start if you have never done it before and you are an artist and most artists don't have extensive experience in that uh, at least you know the, the, the lion's share of the several thousand campaigns that happen a year I think there's a mentality too among creative types and artists where they don't want to have to do that. You know, you look at marketing as something that's sort of uh, self-promotion. I don't really want to do that. I just want to do my creative work. And then when they start to try and learn these different skills, they end up get, just getting frustrated, spending time Googling around the internet. And up they're like, you know what? I'm just going to launch this campaign. And then they end up launching and it doesn't go as they wished or as they hoped because they didn't have a really good blueprint to launch it. And that's always so unfortunate to see because it just creates frustration, creates anxiety. And when that campaign doesn't go well, they have to then sort of pick themselves off the ground and figure out why that is. So to have any kind of proven plan, any kind of at least strategy or tips to follow, that is golden, I think. So for the people in the audience who are listening and sort of want one or two tips here as to what they should be focusing on in the pre-launch phase, what would you say to them, particularly the artists? Uh, well, I will say two things. There are two big things to focus on in the pre-launch phase. One is to keep in mind that the best way to, to capitalize on crowdfunding is to make your campaign more about why you do what you do, your, your inner purpose and mission, um, and then to layer what the next thing is you're going to do on top of that. Um, so what do I mean by that? Most people who are doing a campaign, particularly musicians, will want to start out right away and say, hey, Sal, don't know if you've heard about my campaign. I am making a CD and it is going to be awesome. You should see this amazing studio I'm going to be recording in in Nashville or down in Austin or L.A. I can't wait. My guest musicians are crazy good and I got this wicked producer who used to work with LL Cool J back in the 80s. And they'll anyway, you get the drift. They'll go on and on and on about this, the bullet points of this of this project that they want to record and you're sitting there and you're like, okay, most of that stuff doesn't really make in, make a difference to me, but I have a relationship with you. I value what you do as an artist. What's, what's going to be the outcome on that level? You know, you might not think that, but it's in your subconscious. So, so instead of starting out with everything about what you're doing in your campaign, you back up a few steps and you start to talk about your whole purpose, which would sound a little bit more like, hey, Sal, it's Ian. Um, haven't caught up you know, since college, but I just wanted to let you know that after I graduated, I got into music, I started this band. It is the most important thing I've ever done with my life. Uh, the music that I make deals with this emotional subject or that emotional subject. And I have really connected with people in a meaningful way over this. I've decided to take a big risk and put myself out there trying to take this career to the next level. And that's what this campaign is about. You know, you so, know what's actually so interesting about that is the first example that you gave just kind of engaged like the logic side of my mind. And it sounded like you were trying to get me to do something like it sounded like you were almost promoting to me. The second one more so engaged the emotional part. Like, I feel like I know you. That is some way that like a friend would talk to me. That's not a, some way that a marker marketer would talk to me. It kind of made me be like, huh, like what's happening in this guy's life? Absolutely. And the, I mean, you, you nailed it. And that picks up on, on the second tip that I was going to give. And that is know your audience. If you go out and Google crowdfunding tips and tricks, almost, you know, any five or seven or 10 point bullet list of the top 10 things to do when you're crowdfunding, one of them is going to say something along the lines of, know your audience slash build an audience slash build your tribe, right? And all, all they mean is engage people. 
But let's take it a step back. Do they really mean engage any random people? I mean, probably not, right? Who would you rather engage when you were trying to develop a relationship around your art? Just a boatload of random people or people who have demonstrated interest in what you're doing. And those people, uh, you know who they are. They're your fans that you do have. Or if you're just getting started, they're your friends and your family. And they're the people around you within an arm's length that you can literally literally reach out and touch and have a conversation with. Um, so when you understand who you should be taking your campaign to, which is people you know, if you take your campaign to a bunch of people you don't know, well, you know, conversion rates in the marketing industry, a lot of people are happy with like a half a percent of cold conversion, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you'd have to reach a, a whole boatload of people to turn that into any substantial amount of crowdfunding support. And you'd probably spend more reaching them than you would, um, make on the campaign. But when it comes to the people, you know, which are your current fans, your current customers, that's where, that's where any business who knows what they're doing would start anytime they launched, right? Mm. They go right to their customer list when they're trying to proof that stuff out. So you start with your fans, your friends, your family. Um, the, the other thing I just want to, I just want to preface here for the listeners. This is also specifically, I would say for a music type campaign because product campaigns obviously will do paid advertising. Uh, but I think that's a really, really salient point. Uh, I also do want to dig a little bit more into that. But the other thing I just want to quickly mention before I forget is we tend to also, when we pitch someone or we mention something that we're doing, we get super nerdy and technical. Like we think that everyone has the knowledge about these different bands and artists and like everyone is as knowledgeable as we are about musicians. And that's not simply the case. But what people are always drawn into, at least from my experience, is story. And to give you an example here, you know, the people listening to this podcast, um, you might have never wanted to watch a two hour long video on computer programming, unless you're really into computer programming. But everyone is willing to watch the social network, which is about this whole website and programming and all these different things because of the story element behind that. And that's another thing that really just stood out to me with your the second pitch. It made it seem like more of a story. Absolutely. Um, that's that's the first area you want to focus on connecting with people. And so, yeah, just just to add on to your point, absolutely. I'm talking about creative genres like like music and like writing. Um, you, you know, it works the same way, whether you have fans or you don't, but where you're at in your career will probably influence the extent to which you have a fan base. And the bigger your fan base is probably the, the less you will need to lean on, on family and close friends. But there are those family and close friends when you're, when you're a creative person that will always want to support you. And you need to honor those relationships by letting people know when you're doing something in your life that is, is a big, big deal and contributes to your overall mission and purpose in being here. So, Always good to keep in mind because a lot of people are scared to go talk to friends and family. They they feel like they are sabotaging the relationship by asking for money. Mm -hmm. um, you're not asking for money. You're letting them know what you're up to and the fact that what you're up to is a huge deal in your life. If they want to support that, fantastic. To any extent they want to, whether it's a dollar or a thousand dollars. And if they just want to say, good job, I'll keep rooting for you then that's fine too. You're not saying, hey man, can you float me a 50 spot? Um, that's a recipe for resentment, right? Yeah, <laughs> so totally. You, you, that's going to be you have an to, awkward Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, you have to lead with opportunity and abundance and have care for both what you're doing and for the person you're talking to. Right. Um, People vibe you know, off of you a lot, I would say. I did want to ask you uh, just two really quickly specific questions because I know that if I was listening to this podcast, the first thing I'd want to know is, so Ian, if I don't have a audience, does that mean I can't do crowdfunding for my music project? 
Yes, that is a good question. That's not my answer. The answer is anybody can do crowdfunding, even if you're just starting off. Um, the scope of your project is obviously going to change if you've never done a project before versus if it's your fifth recording. Um, people who are just starting out should literally lean on the relationships they have. Uh, that is the best place to start. Not asking them specifically for money. Again, we are leading with opportunity and our purpose. But letting the people know who are the closest to you what you're up to and letting them respond the way that it makes sense to them respond. There are a lot of people in your life right now, even if you have never played a note of music outside of your bedroom, who would have your back, right? We all have close friends. Hope, you know, Some of us are lucky enough to have really supportive family. Um, but you, you need to not need to be, be afraid to, to engage people. Yeah, you do have to put it out there, but if you do it, if you lead with your purpose, it is so authentic mm -hmm. because you're just, I mean, it, it could be like you're sitting on a couch, you know, over beers after watching a string of eighties movies and you just like level with someone, you know, yeah. Hey man, you know what I've always really wanted to do? It's this dream in my heart. It's this, well, turns out I'm going to do it and here's what it's going to take. And the people who support you, they will want to know more about that. And some of them will help you out. Not, not all of them. You can't expect all of them, but some of them will. And it, it might surprise a person. The second question I had here too was, I know that I get emails all the time from people who are in the middle of a campaign and they just discovered the podcast. And they're wondering, you know, I'm not really seeing the success that I thought. So if you could speak to someone in the audience who is currently running a campaign, say a music campaign, they haven't really gotten that many backers or pledges, what should they do? Should they cancel it, rethink it, read your book first? Should they keep trying to be aggressive and like apply the techniques we're talking about now? What do you usually recommend in those instances? Yeah, I wish I could give a blanket recommendation, but, but really the only one that would apply is let's analyze what's going on. Because what you do is a function of several different things. How big is your goal and how far away from it are you? You know, what exactly have you been doing to reach out to people? Um, if your goal is really reasonable, like let's say you just got started, but your goal is a couple thousand dollars. To me, that's probably reasonable. If you've raised a couple hundred dollars of support, you're on track. I would not cancel that campaign. I would sit down and I would be really frank and honest with myself about exactly what I've been doing to let people know about my campaign. And if the answer is I've posted the link to Facebook every day, then you're not doing enough and you need to get off your rear and start contacting people by calling them on the phone or sending them text messages or personal Facebook messages that let the person know what you're up to and why it's so important. Um, if you've been reaching out to people and you haven't been getting a response, like if you've literally sent 50 emails to your 50 closest friends and just nobody is responding, you might have a problem with your message. It probably goes back to the example earlier where we talked about just rattling off a bunch of stuff and nerding out about the specific things you're going to do with your campaign, which might not resonate with any, but the person listening at all. Um, they might need more of the story and need more of the background. So that's the, that's another good thing. Um, if you're trying to do a $10,000 campaign and you've been live for 20 days and you have four days or six days left or even two weeks and you've only raised like 500 bucks, 800 bucks, you might scrap it. You might, you might kill the campaign and start over. We did that with an artist named Alex Ivy. She's from Seattle. And I rarely tell people to quit in the middle of their campaign. But hers was just one of those where she needed to, to start over, lower her goal amount a little bit. She was just overreaching um, for more money than, than her circle of influence would be able to provide. So we started over, refocused her message, um, to, to lead with purpose and tie in the campaign to, to, to that part of her life. And everything turned out great. Uh, she, she raised quite a bit of money with her second campaign. Um, 
and was plum tickled. And that's another thing to remember. Uh, this is one of the frequently asked questions I get, <laughs> you know, is where should I be in my campaign? I've launched I'm halfway through my campaign and I've only raised 20% of my funds. A lot of people think that's a problem. They think I'm halfway through my campaign. I should have half of the funds. Not necessarily true. Um, a lot of people raise 50 to 75% of their total funding in the last three days. Uh, the last three days, and you've probably observed this too, is always a flurry of activity. If you can if, if during the front part and middle part of your campaign, if you can get in spitting distance, you know, mm. if you're 30 or 40 percent of the way, you're golden. You're going to have to work it. You know, you're going to have to make contact with people, but you can probably do it. It is yeah. so incredibly rare, particularly in these creative genres, for a campaign to get above 70 percent and not fund. Mm -hmm. Um you know, that's a, that's I, a really I, good point too. That at the last, you know, few days, there's just such urgency there, where people who were on the fence or people who weren't paying attention in your life for whatever reason, we all lead very busy lives. Then are like, oh man, I have to pledge because this thing is gonna close. So they get in their pledge then. Also, yep. part of the reason why I think par uh, people or some people have that need to get to like a 50% level so soon is I just stress that a lot in everything that I put out. And it's kind of to put urgency under people as well to make sure that they're thinking about this at least. Um, what is another memorable campaign that you have helped or one or two others that you could share with the listeners? Yeah, well... You know, I write about this in the book a little bit. It, it, she was one of the first people I ever reached out to in 2012 while we were researching 100 Kickstarters. And she was probably one of the first seven artists that I ever talked to. <laughs> and um, oh, I suppose I sent her a message midway through her campaign. She was trying to raise $18,000, I think. Her name was Neva. And uh, this, this is, again, in the first chapter of, of the book. So I'm, I'm spoiling it a little bit, but it's not a big deal. She was at $3,000 or so. I, by the time she messaged me back, it was three days from the end of her campaign, and she was at like 5000 and going for 18000 And she's like, what should I do? And I write her back, and I said, uh, I'm not really an expert yet. I just started researching this, but near as I can tell, you should probably start getting a hold of people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, she pretty much did and God, made about $12,000, which was around two thirds of her campaign, I think in the last, in the last three to four days of her Jeez, campaign and hit wow. her goal. And I was just astounded. I think she had a, you know, I think she had enough of a fan base to make that happen. Not everybody's just going to go raise eighteen thousand dollars. So clearly, she had enough uh, people to pull from to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But I think she had had just a little bit of maybe a messaging problem and just was relying was relying too much on social media and not enough on personal contact because. You and I both know, and, and probably everybody listening does too, how easy it is to not see something in a Facebook feed, yeah. or even if we do see it, to not take action, because we're totally anonymous behind our screen. But if, if Sal calls Ian and says, hey man, here's here's this thing, it's a really big deal, and Ian listens, well, you, you, that's a lot different story with a lot different probability of the person backing you. So Yeah, it's that, far more personal, was, definitely, I would say. And that is remarkable that she was able to do that. That also just underlies the fact that many of us, when we're doing a campaign or any kind of launch, we tend to sort of limit our own thinking or limit what's possible. And if we actually max out you know, our network, we max out really trying hard, putting 100% into the campaign, it's amazing what you can actually do. So that's a really cool story. I uh, didn't mean Absolutely. to cut you off there if you were sharing another one. Just just one more. Uh, I worked with this guy in 2013. It was about a year after we had started. And we'd put together um, the six-step launch process that I present in An Artist Guide to Crowdfunding Domination. And also that is the, the backbone of my online materials. And so we had these six steps in place. And we were pretty sure that they were right. But we were getting um, getting people to work with just for free to try and proof it out, you know, proof out the concept. And this fella from New York City, Jay Stolar, got a hold of us. And man, 
when you just launched a website in the last year and you throw it out there, hey, we'd love to work with some people, you don't know who you're going to get through the door, right? I mean, <laughs> it could be anybody. And we, but of course, you know, you still talk to him and we talked to him and he had about 2,000 people on his mailing list and he had an ambitious plan. He wanted to raise $25,000 for his first solo album. Um, he had some experience in the in the New York music scene. He'd had a band uh, that had raised about eight thousand dollars. So four people in the band had pooled their resources and raised eight thousand dollars through their first crowdfunding campaign. Jay wanted to blow this out of the water, and we were like, uh, "Yeah, I don't know how that's gonna go, but you do have two thousand people on a mailing list, and you seem like a." like an enthusiastic guy and he was enthusiastic and engaging as all get out. And he's like, yep, feed me. So we jumped into it, designed his campaign. He was a very willing student and also very able. He soaked it all in and put out, and this is what I I'm amazed at. One of the things in hindsight is that this guy walked through the door and was like our perfect candidate. Uh, so it, I totally scored that way that he wasn't just some crack job, <laughs> you know, trying to make a little money. Yeah. So he gets out, does it. We're like, dude, 25,000 might be a bit of a reach. We think you might be able to get there, but let's set your goal at 15. So he did. Um, we, we used our preload technique and, you know, our camp, our campaign stuff. That's, that's just a, a way that you launch your campaign specifically reaching out to people. And he hit his goal amount in three days. He, he raised $15,000 in three days. That is awesome. Um, yeah, we were totally stoked. And, and then he went on a trip to Mexico uh, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people plan a Mexico vacation in the middle of their crowdfunding. Not the campaign. best idea. Not the best idea. Because <laughs> you probably should be reaching out to people. Um, but but he had done that, and it was all in the works. And we went through it. He came back, and we kept working. And by about the last week, I think we were up to twenty grand or so. He was very willing to to talk to people personally. And in in that last week, which is when your backers start coming out of the woodwork and that's because of scarcity. You know, I don't know if, if you've, uh, read, uh, Dr. Chaldini's book, uh, influence, the psychology of persuasion or yeah. Influence. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. I'm looking for it on my bookshelf and oh, I, no, I love that book. Yeah. The psychology of influence. Is that what it's called? I think it's influence. And then he recently wrote a book called Persuasion, which is really fascinating. If you haven't had a chance to read that. Oh, I should read that. Yeah, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. That's probably it. Mm -hmm. This is Dr. Robert Cialdini. He's a psych psychologist. People, if you're listening, you should pick up this book because it he lays changer. out... Complete game changer. It, it really is, and it lays out the six biggest persuasive reasons there are. Not, not He doesn't call them techniques. He just They're things that persuade, and he leaves it at that. Scarcity is one of the biggest ones, and there's nothing that brings scarcity about like a countdown timer and the possibility that what you want might shut off and not be available. So that's why people really start to take action in the last week. Uh, long story short, he got from twenty twenty five thousand dollars to forty thousand dollars, kind of in what we call end sequence stages. And two days before the campaign was done, he was at $40,000. And we were all blown away because he'd made fifteen grand in the first three days. It was for his first release as a solo artist. Um, he'd, he'd blown past his real goal, which was his real goal was $25,000. He'd already beat that. He's at $40,000. And we are like, dude, That's we're looking phenomenal. at each other. We're looking at each other around the table. And we're like, this we have just maxed out. I mean, we should just shut this off right now. <laughs> and Jay's like, what do you think? Should I, should I set another stretch goal? Should I go for more? And we all kind of him and hot. And well, finally we're like, well, do you have, do you have something you could spend the money on in your budget? If you, if you did go for more and he did, you know, I think he did an international tour or something in the last day or day and a half, he raised another $10,000. Broke the fifty thousand dollar mark for his very first release. Uh, it was just exceptional, phenomenal. It goes to show that if you're willing to reach out to people, and he really put his heart out there. I mean, there was nothing cheesy about it at all. It was, it was his heart, and he was willing to do the work. And he had a plan. He had a good plan. He had a 
a budget for what he would do with the amounts of money he was raising. And man, did people respond. It was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. That's incredible. And what's even more impressive is he did this and also took a trip to Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Again, wouldn't recommend that. Um, it worked out for Jay. So what can you say? Yeah, that, that's so cool. And that's also cool to hear that, um, you know, in, in so many ways, these different launching campaigns, you're getting out of your comfort zone, you don't really know what your potential is. And being able to see that he was able to do that, I imagine after that, he's now just growing so much more as an artist, as someone who's putting creative work into the world. Like I imagine for him, that was sort of a life changing experience. I'm speaking to the crowdfunders in the audience who have already launched a Kickstarter campaign or have actually even successfully run a campaign. And the reason is, I think you will understand this pain point most. And that is, when you finally do raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the hardest part is not collecting the cash. The hardest part is shipping out all of those perks and rewards to your backers. It is a nightmare, my friends. It's a lot of spreadsheets. It's a lot of headache, and it's a lot of stress. That's why I recommend BackerKit. If you have not heard of BackerKit, they help you collect surveys, they help you collect data, and the entire fulfillment process is just so much easier and so many less spreadsheets when you use their software. You can check them out at backerkit.com and use CrowdCrux for a special discount. Yes, it really was. And he has maintained that trajectory moving forward. Um, he hasn't done another campaign because he's had enough people interested in what he's doing. And he, he does things, when he does things, he does them as professionally as possible. So he likes to do things at the upper limits of what's possible for him. And um, it's, it, yeah, he, he finds all kinds of support and traction. And, you know, he's still climbing his way up. Um, widespread success doesn't come easily. And, and we never know to what extent his, his career will be successful uh, measured by the, you know, standard things of dollars or album sales. But he is very fulfilled as a person. And that's probably the most important thing. Uh, he's doing something that is incredibly fulfilling, and he does it in a way where he's not sitting around starving. He has a fan base. He plays big shows. He flies back and forth between New York and L.A. and does his thing the way he wants to do it. So it's it's uh, really heartening for that reason, and I, I hope he just continues to have more and more success. It's very easy nowadays to play the comparison game where you're comparing how much money you raise with someone else and looking at all these different campaigns in your category and which ones raise the most, all this kind of stuff. What it sort of comes down to, and I love the way that you put it, is it's doing work that you care about, that you are passionate about, and using crowdfunding as one way to doing that full time and doing that in sort of a larger way where you're affecting more people. Um, where can people also check you out? I want to make sure that uh, we mention this so people can be notified about when the book comes out and also check out your, your content. Yeah, well, the best place to go is the website launchandrelease.com. Uh, I'll send a link on over to you so you can make sure and have it. The book is coming out on February 14th. It'll be available. I, I keep saying book. I use that loosely. It's an ebook. It's definitely an ebook. Uh, so, you know, PDF, EPUB, Kindle Reader, those sorts of things. And um, yeah, it, we can get people kind of hooked up. Awesome. The last, I'm going to let you have the last word here and sort of be able to speak to the audience. You could say, uh, you know, word of encouragement. You could provide another tip or a bit of advice, or you could even share where you see yourself in launch and release going in the future. Oh, man, where to start? Yeah, we could spend hours here. Um, one thing you, you said real quick is you said do, do work that you want to do. Seth Godin always says this, right? If, you're, if you don't read Seth Godin, Google Seth Godin, find him. He's a marketing guru, but, but he's, he's a man who, who leads with purpose and from the heart, and he says it all the time. Do work worth doing. Um, He's inspirational for those of us who work creatively to keep us moving forward and to help us stay focused on taking the parts of us that are 
in our core being and bringing them out into the world. When things look discouraging, he can break you out of that. So that's huge. Um, one more thing. This is my last thing, but I just wanted to throw out a few statistics that I've found that I, I think are incredibly interesting. Um, the first thing is when it comes to music crowdfunding, 50% of campaigns fail. When you throw in all the other creative genres um, like film, books, arts and crafts, it's like 60%. The overall failure rate is 60%. Six out of 10 campaigns that are launched fail, uh, which is incredibly disheartening to me. And I look at a lot of them. You, you know, you don't just look at the winners. You got to look at the losers too. And what happens to a lot of them is when, when you stack them up and see where what happened, they didn't – not only did they not break their goal, they actually didn't even make any money. Like they got – Maybe three pledges probably didn't break a hundred bucks. What do you think happens in all of those campaigns? It's something that you said earlier in the show, Sal. You put together this campaign, you talk about what you're doing, you throw it up there, and then you kind of throw up your hands because you don't have a plan. And when you don't have a plan, <laughs> nothing happens. Um, crowdfunding doesn't mean that there is a crowd that they will give your campaign to. It means that you define your crowd and take your campaign to it. So it, it's really easy to not end up a failure statistic. Uh, all it takes is some appropriate design and planning and, and then follow through. But just make sure that if you want to do something, it's not just I made a video talking about what I want to do and now I'm posting it over and over to my Facebook page. Uh, meanwhile, I'm living my life pretending like I don't have a campaign going. So not the recipe for success. Very well said. Uh, that's a point I always want to reiterate. Thank you for sharing that. And also thanks for sharing the message from Seth. That's really okay. meaningful. Ian, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. I got to have you back at some point. Uh, and I'll be definitely watching to see the progress of your site and all the new things you're coming out with. Well, I sure appreciate your time, Sal. It's been fun, and we'll look forward to the next time. If you do want to leverage to the max your PR potential, if you want to get in the media, you want the media to write about you, and you want to use that to elevate your brand and get free traffic, which you can turn into buyers, backers, revenue, and new customers, go and check out crowdcrux.com slash PR. This is a lot of effort and time that I've invested in these training tutorial videos. I think you're going to like them, but there is no obligation here. You can just get on the email list. You can take advantage of some of the free things I'm going to be sharing. And then when the time comes, you can decide whether or not to join the community and to enroll in this course. It is totally up to you. I do think you're going to get a great ROI from this content. I'm really trying to make it extremely actionable and and results focused. Again, thank you for joining me on this podcast episode. That is crowdcrux.com slash PR, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash PR. I'll see you next time.